tonight on Reporting Scotland. The Scottish Government backs a third runway for Heathrow Airport, claiming it'll create thousands of jobs here. The impact of Brexit on Scotland's biggest city. Council chiefs call for funding guarantees to maintain Glasgow's prosperity. Leaked papers show how RBS exploited struggling businesses it claimed it was trying to help. The arts festival that's aiming to encourage us to look after our mental health. And we'll be live in Slovakia with the Tartan Army, as Scotland's footballers bid to get their World Cup campaign back on track. Good evening. The Scottish Government has thrown its weight behind the expansion of Heathrow Airport as opposed to its rival Gatwick. It described the building of a third runway at Heathrow as the best deal for Scotland, leading to investment and job creation here. It's expected a final decision by the UK Government will be made later this month. Suzanne Allen reports. They may be over 400 miles away, but the future of Heathrow and Gatwick Airport does matter to the Scottish economy. Today, the Scottish Government said they would back Heathrow as they'd secured a deal to support jobs and growth up here. It's for increased flights, so more regular flights, easier to get uh, to London, easier for folk from London and the rest of the world to come to us. Of course, we want to have additional direct flights to Scotland, that's very important, but people will be very interested in the connectivity to the rest of the UK and to London in particular. The Scottish Government and Heathrow have signed a Memorandum of Understanding. This includes the creation of over 16,000 jobs, but over several decades, and £200 million of construction-related work. Prestwick Airport is hoping to increase its role as a cargo hub, so that means shipping components and machines made by Scottish companies down to London. And Aberdeen and Inverness also want better access to Heathrow for worldwide flights. It opens up accessibility for the regions, so regions like ours will be competing for additional slots at a reduced rate, which is what Heathrow have undertaken to do. Now for us today, we have a single flight uh, to and from London Heathrow. I'm hopeful that providing Heathrow gets the go-ahead, that we could be up to perhaps two flights a day within as many years. Not everyone is happy. Rival Gatwick and its sister business Edinburgh both say the deal will make Scottish passengers more reliant on London been put off for long enough and whatever that decision is, whether it's Heathrow or Gatwick, we need to make sure that Scotland has the connectivity and the flights and services into those airports to allow our businesses to benefit from the investment and expansion. Other campaigners are sceptical about the boost to business and fear the cost to the environment. I think there's a great overestimate of the number of jobs and the economic benefit of airport expansion and completely ignoring the climate change impacts. The Scottish Government have decided what they think is the best plan for this country. A decision is expected in around 10 days. Suzanne Allen reporting Scotland, Presswick. Well, a decision on whether Heathrow or Gatwick will be expanded will need to be ratified by a vote in the House of Commons. Let's go to our Westminster correspondent, David Porter. And David, what will be the political impact of the Scottish Government's decision to back Heathrow? Jackie, very simply, potentially this could be a game changer and it could make it far simpler to get the proposals through. The SNP has a block of 54 MPs at Westminster, so it could make things far clearer. Now, the, the fact that the Scottish Government and the SNP are throwing their weight behind Heathrow could actually make it a lot easier for the UK Government if they decide to back a third runway for Heathrow. Heathrow is going to be a massive infrastructure project, but it is also massively controversial, and there are many Tory MPs who are again it. The fact that the SNP have now come on board means that Theresa May may well be able to say to her MPs, you can have a free vote on this, because quite frankly, she knows that she will have the votes in the bag with those 54 SNP MPs. Now, the SNP says it's made its decision because it feels it's in the interests of Scotland uh, for the economy. It will bring extra jobs to Scotland, but vitally, it will also bring that, that connectivity to it as well. It'll make it easier to get 
get people from the rest of the world into London and then on to Scotland and for Scottish businessmen and travellers who go down to London and can then fly to uh, wherever they want in the world. It is worth, though, making two points. One, a final decision has not been made yet. Uh, the UK Cabinet will be meeting within the next 10 days or so to make that decision. And whatever happens, not only will it be controversial, there will probably be legal challenges as well. So whatever happens, people will not be taking off or landing at a new airport in the southeast of London, most likely in Heathrow, probably for at least a decade. Well, David, let's talk about another complicated issue then, Brexit. And uh, the Commons debate says was dominated today by increasing pressure on the government to allow MPs to, to vote on the conditions of leaving. But also there has been controversy, increasing controversy, about the role of the devolved parliaments in negotiations. Yes, they have. Uh, Heathrow aside, the dominant issue at the moment, and I think for many months and years to come, will be Brexit and how the UK exits itself from the European Union. Today was the first day back for MPs and they were not going to miss the opportunity to question ministers on that announcement from the Prime Minister last week that she would invoke Article 50 by the end of March next year. And again, ministers were questioned on what would be the role of Scotland in those exit talks. What plans does he have to formally involve the devolved administrations. I notice that he talked about involving the devolved administrations previously. He now talks about consulting with the devolved administrations. The objectives are simple. Meet the instruction from the British people, which means regain control of our borders, regain control of our, of our laws, regain, regain control of our money, and at the same time, get the best possible access to the European market that we can negotiate. End of story. It's very simple. Now, ministers insist that they want what they call a calm and orderly exit to the EU. But there's a growing head of steam here, Jackie, at Westminster for MPs to be given a greater role. Now, Downing Street is saying that MPs will not get a chance to vote on the negotiating strategy. But there are hints tonight that when a final deal is reached with Europe, it may be two, two and a half years' time, then MPs may get a vote on whether they think it's a good idea or not. Thank you very much, David. Well, the timeline for Brexit may be unclear, but what's certain is that it will affect us all, from individuals to major cities. Well, such is the concern felt by the city of Glasgow that it commissioned a report highlighting the challenges and indeed the opportunities of Brexit. It's also got a wish list for the politicians, as John McManus reports. The UK as a whole has decided to get out of the European Union. That was the result. Do we know yet what it means? This morning, Glasgow City Council published a report on the challenges and opportunities facing the city after Brexit. The most important, it says, is the potential loss of EU structural funds, totalling £780 million, which pay for training, development and social programmes. The council wants that money guaranteed by Westminster and Holyrood, but is that likely at such a time of political uncertainty? Let's not navel gaze about imagined constitutional arrangements. In the here and now, we need practical, pragmatic proposals to give confidence back to the business community. And that's about bringing investment forward early. And it's about finding ways in which we can make sure that the European structural funds are still kept in the Glasgow economy. The report also calls on the £1 billion city deal to be accelerated fast-forwarding the proposed rail link to Glasgow Airport. Glasgow's strengths include its retail sector, second only to London's West End. But owners fear that any future trade tariffs will make imports more expensive, though a weaker pound could bring more tourist shoppers. Business leaders fear that their concerns aren't being taken seriously. At the very best, we have to continue to make the arguments. It may feel at the moment as if uh, government has taken a slightly anti-business perspective uh, at Westminster uh, and that's an incredibly dangerous position to be in. And it's not just the tourist trade that may go elsewhere. Academic leaders are also worried. They say 15,000 foreign students are in the city. More than 6,000 of those are from the EU as well as more than 1,000 staff and £25 million worth of grants from the EU go to Strathclyde University alone.
Council and business people know that they're going to have to work hard to protect Glasgow during Brexit. They also know that other cities across the UK are clamouring just as loudly. John McManus, reporting Scotland, Glasgow. Police searching for a 15-year-old girl last seen on the banks of the River Tay say a body has been recovered from the water. Kathleen Harkin was last seen on Saturday evening in Perth. Police say efforts to identify the body are ongoing. The teenager's family has been informed. A man has died from injuries sustained in a fall on Ben Nevis. The incident happened on the north face of the mountain on Friday evening when the alarm was raised by the victim's climbing companion. The men were found by the Lochaber Mountain Rescue Team and airlifted from the scene during the early hours of the morning. Police have thanked rescuers for their courageous efforts carried out in the dark and in difficult conditions. Police are investigating whether the death of a 56-year-old man at a flat in North Ayrshire is linked to attacks on two other men just over four hours later. The man's body was discovered at the flat in Stevenson on Saturday morning. Police are looking at possible links to the attempted murder of a 52-year-old man who's being treated for life-threatening injuries. A 30-year-old man was treated for a serious injury after being assaulted. The pair were found at a property on Misk Nose. Leaked documents have shown that Royal Bank of Scotland sought to profit by buying up assets cheaply from struggling businesses which it claimed to be helping. The documents reveal bank staff could boost their bonuses by finding businesses which could be squeezed and what was described internally as a dash for cash. Well, our business and economy editor Douglas Fraser is here to tell us more. So, what is being claimed here, Douglas? Well, this is about a division of Royal Bank of Scotland, which took on business customers in the, which had got into trouble in the wake of the financial crash, which was underway nine years ago. The idea is that they either give these business customers intensive care and help them turn around, or they pull the plug to protect the bank's uh, interest in getting its creditors to, to pay their dues, what they borrowed. Now, that much is true of any bank, but what's different about uh, the Global Restructuring Group, as it was known at RBS, is that there have been quite, some quite serious allegations that they could move the goalposts uh, and whether their, their loan conditions were being met just by revaluing uh, assets uh, of uh, customers' businesses. It's all this as a unit for making profit. There were bonuses to be made for staff who could refer companies uh, and 12,000 companies were put into this uh, GRG at a time of big crisis for the economy. There may have been a conflict of interest in that a bit of the bank was buying assets from these companies that had uh, been forced into administration. And it's been alleged that RBS pulled the plug on profitable, sustainable companies and wrecked lives in the process. Today we got leaked uh, evidence to support several of these allegations. The leaked documents show that the bank was uh, in what it called a dash for cash, as you say. The people running this division were doing it quite aggressively. The bank says there is no evidence that it deliberately sank viable companies, forcing them into administration, but it does concede that it let down some of its business customers and fell short of its, its own standards. So if this can be proven, it's more reputational bad news for RBS. How does it fit in with the bank's efforts to get back on its feet? Well, this is one of the more damaging uh, episodes. The really big expensive mistakes at, at RBS were partly because of greed and, and not really understanding uh, what they were doing. And they've paid a heavy price also in compensation for mis-selling financial products. But in this case, it looks like permanent damage to customers. And that's the most important trusting relationship of all. And it followed after the notorious Fred Goodwin era, when things were supposed to be getting better. The, the Royal Bank has known that this was coming for some time. There's a regulatory in inquiry yet to be published. A group of customers are preparing legal action. They reckon this will help this. This evidence will help them. They'll get into court early next year. For RBS, it's one of the two really big obstacles it needs to get over still. The other one being litigation in the US about alleged misleading of, of shareholders over how deep its problems were eight years ago. More on this particular story, though, tonight on Newsnight, BBC Two Scotland at 11. Thank you very much, Douglas. You're watching BBC Reporting Scotland. It's 17 minutes to seven. A reminder of tonight's top story. The Scottish Government backs a third runway for Heathrow, claiming it could create thousands of jobs here. And still to come, why one man's love of bricks has put him in line for a prestigious award. 
important is your mental health compared to your physical health? If you think it's just as important, but you don't take the time to look after it, then you're not alone. A survey to mark World Mental Health Day suggests a significant number of us don't look after our psychological well-being. So taking time out to do just that is the message of a Scotland-wide arts festival beginning today. Our arts correspondent Pauline McLean reports. Experts in short trousers is a piece of theatre for five-year-olds and their families. These aliens have been crash landing into spaces across Scotland. This morning it was Kelvin Grove Museum. It's really lovely actually to come at it from such a young age because it's a lot about finding spaces to, to realise that people are different and we're obviously a group of aliens so we're very different but also a space to, to really recognise what people are strong at. I saw myself in voluntarily last night. Yes, you can. What began 10 years ago as a small film showcase has since become a major festival. Alongside films, there's theatre, exhibitions and music in all some 300 events across the country. Nobody knows where you are. Among them, a new touring show about Sid Barrett, the original lead singer of Pink Floyd in the 1960s. The band have said that themselves, that back then there wasn't a great deal known about a lot of these issues um, and people are now much more aware and much more knowledgeable and he might have been able to get the help and the treatment that he needed at the time. Today that's changed, not least thanks to festivals like this, where mental health can be discussed openly and advice and support offered. Mental health being much more talked about in popular culture, so um, a lot of TV shows deal with mental health very well now and, and very sensitively. We bring together organisations and artists and individuals that might not otherwise work together, which I think is quite a powerful thing. But there's still some way to go. Although the vast majority of Scots consider their mental health as important as physical well-being, at least a quarter of us admit to not finding the time to do anything about it. And that's the message of this year's festival. Find the time and use it well. Holly McLean reporting Scotland. A former prisoner of war who credited the Nagasaki atomic bomb with saving his life has died. He was 97. Gordon Highlander Alistair Urquhart said the bomb prevented a Japanese plan to massacre Allied POWs. He was blown off his feet by the Nagasaki bomb in 1945. He also survived a ship being torpedoed. Aberdeen-born Mr Urquhart of Rotty Ferry passed away in a Dundee care home. A play exploring the turmoil in the oil industry and what it means for Scotland's oil workers opens in Dundee tomorrow in a rather unusual setting. Andrew Anderson has been finding out some more. Oil rigs like these are a common sight at the port of Dundee, but now it has a more unusual link with that industry. Within the port, in the shadow of these rigs, stands a giant metal shed. In here, ships were once built, but now it's been transformed into a theatre. Those Scottish offshore guys, they don't want to be thought of as soft. They want to be tougher than whalebone. This so is Crude, a play examining what oil has meant to Scotland and to those who bring it ashore. It's a hugely important subject in Scotland in terms of where the, where the oil revenue went since 1975, um, where a lot of the profits, there's a lot of thoughts that a lot of the profits which should have stayed within the borders of Scotland as they did in Norway. The only thing you have is a gauge and it's going down. And if it goes to nothing, your well is dead and you are dead in the water. So, the theatre company Gridiron are well known for staging performances in unusual locations. In the past, that's included airports, car parks and climbing centres. It means the company has to build a theatre from scratch. We had to work very closely with the um, people on the port to make sure that we had enough electricity. Um, we have to bring everything that you see with us, which does, um, it does add to the sort of logistical planning and the financial planning of, of a production like this. And as soon as you've got your pressure, that natural gas is the natural energy that lifts the oil right out of the column. Crude will be staged here for the next two weeks. The company hopes this industrial setting will help the audience experience what life is like out on the rigs. Andrew Anderson, reporting Scotland, Dundee. The Scotland football team are in Slovakia for their third match of the World Cup qualifying campaign. They're undefeated so far, but Saturday night's draw at home to Lithuania has led to widespread criticism. Well, Alistair Lamont is with the team in Slovakia where I understand they're hoping to make amends, Al. 
Yes, very much so. And uh, you join me, in fact, inside Slovan Bratislava Stadium with the Scotland squad training behind me, working on maybe some of the things that didn't quite go to plan on Saturday night. I have to say if it's affected the spirits at all, the players are hiding it pretty well, but there has been an acknowledgement that they should have done better on Saturday night. Gordon Strachan, though, has reiterated his view that the second half performance, at least, uh, was better, and that's what he's asking the players to take into a full 90 minutes against Slovakia tomorrow night. And uh, the thing is that Gordon Strachan has also acknowledged that second place might well be the best that Scotland can now hope for, and that would mean a playoff at best. Gordon Strachan's popularity in Slovakia is undiminished, but as he and his squad arrive this afternoon, perhaps for the first time the same can't be said about his standing with Scotland fans. These supporters and thousands like them had overwhelmingly backed the manager, despite the failure to reach Euro 2016. But has their attitude begun to change in recent weeks? It seemed to turn quite quickly and I don't actually know why. I mean, we had a couple of friendlies that seemed to turn over the course of the Italy and the France friendlies and they were just friendlies against two decent teams. He's Team selections have been a bit questionable. People like Tierney not getting in the starting 11. Griffiths not getting in the starting 11. It's questionable. Strachan's record in 18 competitive games is unspectacular, with eight wins, four draws and six defeats. As he seeks to improve the record away from home, he accepts automatic qualification is already a long shot. I think most of us expect, and I think you know, the, the football and world, that England would win it. Uh, as I said, but it's a crazy, it's a crazy gang here in this, uh, the group that we've got. So you never know. Second, yes, we will, we will definitely go and try and get second, at least. And if you end up going first, then great. But second's our target as we, as we sit here. There will be personnel changes from the team that drew with Lithuania. But though absent from this training session, Darren Fletcher is determined to be involved. If I'm able to play, of course I'm, I'm desperate to play. Uh, I've got nothing really to save myself for. You know, obviously club games are important, but representing your countries um, equally is important. And Darren Fletcher sitting just a few yards away from me watching this training session. He'll have a, a fitness test tomorrow to gauge whether he's able to play. As for Slovakia, well, they're in even more dire need of a victory tomorrow night. No points from their opening two games. You could see that Scotland are actually catching them. The second seeds in the group had a pretty good time. Thank you very much, Alistair. A police officer from Jedbra has been nominated for a national award because of a collection of more than 2,300 bricks he keeps in his garden shed. Mark Cranston will find out in the next few days if he's won. Our reporter Cameron Buttle went to meet him and ask, why? When did you start, actually start collecting then? Brick collecting it's first of all, about five years ago, seriously. Um, but you've always had an interest as from a boy. Yeah, history in general, yeah, from a boy, um, from an early an early age. Well, this is it. This is the um, shed with my bricks. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You've got one or two, haven't you? You look at a brick mark, the name on a brick, and once you delve into it and uh, have a right research into it, it's amazing where it just bang off it goes into so many strands of Scottish history, whether it's social, family, military even, uh, industrial, agriculture. It's uh, it just never stops giving, to be honest. You get a lot out of it, you enjoy it? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, I go away on uh, trips, hunting through dumps, woods, <laughs> um, uh, old river banks, etc., etc. But the, the thrill, if I can put it that way, of finding a brick that hasn't been recorded or one that I haven't got, it's great. Yeah, it's one more for the collection. Superb. So what makes a good brick, then? Whew. <laughs> is, is, are you just interested in all bricks or is it? Oh yeah, 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 no, absolutely. All, I, I mean, I come across, um, predominantly I'm collecting Scottish bricks, uh, but obviously I come across English bricks and foreign bricks on these shores as well, which I do keep as well. I must get five emails a week from uh, people all over the world, and I mean all over the world, um, finding Scottish bricks on shores. But so many bricks went across to Australia, New Zealand, uh, and Americas, many of them were shipwrecked. So. When you find the underwater archaeologists who are looking at these shipwrecks, uh, unable to date them, they come across a named brick and they're getting in touch to see if I can date the brick as such and help them out date the shipwreck and therefore put a name to it. And what does it mean about being nominated for the award? Oh, it's great. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, I do put a lot of hours, a lot of hours into it, whether it's searching or for bricks themselves or on the, the computer doing the website. So it's. Yeah, it's a little bit of acknowledgement for myself, which is great, but 
more so for the brick itself. It's uh, it's putting it out there, putting it into the limelight. Good luck to him. Cameron Bustle there. And now here's Shelley Joffrey with details of Scotland 2016. Tonight, the Scottish Government throws its weight behind a third runway at Heathrow. Just how much benefit would that bring to Scotland? And a defiant Donald Trump comes out fighting. Has he done enough to save his campaign? Join me for all that and more over on BBC Two at half past ten. Well, let's get the weather now. Over to Corso. Thank you, Jackie. Good evening to you all. Now, many of us enjoyed a lovely sunset this evening and plenty in the way of sunny skies as well, especially across the west. You can see from the recent satellite and radar image, we did have a bit more in the way of clouds spreading in from the east, with also one or two showers across parts of the borders. But as we head through the night, we'll continue to see more in the way of clearer skies. We had some lovely pictures sent in from our weather watchers too. Look at this across Kilmarnock in the west bright blue skies. There was a bit more in the way of cloud across the northeast, but still some lovely bright spells. And tonight, clear spells across the west. The risk of some showers, though, coming in on that breeze in the east, with a bit more in the way of cloud by the end of the night. Those showers across parts of Aberdeenshire, one or two even spreading across parts of the central belt into Glasgow, but they will be light and fleeting. With clear skies across the northwest and Dumfries and Galloway here, it will turn a bit chilly once again for some sheltered glens, maybe down to freezing with a touch of frost and some patchy mist and fog once more. Not as extensive as it was this morning, but it will be quite stubborn to clear. Elsewhere, temperatures six to maybe nine or ten degrees. So then tomorrow there will be more in the way of cloud compared to today and some showers continuing across the east, further towards the west coast here, the best of any brightness. So if you are heading out around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Shetland, lots of sunshine in store here, closest to the area of high pressure across Scandinavia, lighter winds, a bit breezier for Orkney, a good deal of sunshine for the northwest. Here temperatures could climb to maybe 14 or 15 Celsius once again. Cloudier for the central belt, one or two showers perhaps. Most of those showers are towards the east, towards Dumfries and Galloway, sunshine 14 or 15 degrees so that high pressure is still with us for the time being it does look as if it will hold on at least until friday but the winds are more of an easterly we're drawing in more moisture from the north sea so more in the way of showers and it will tend to become a bit windier for wednesday for thursday too making it feel a bit chillier so for wednesday those showers mainly in the east a few drifting further towards the west along that west coast the best of the sunshine but in the breeze it will start to feel a bit cooler that's your forecast Thank you, Cosa. And now a reminder of tonight's main news. The Scottish Government has thrown its weight behind the expansion of Heathrow Airport as opposed to its rival Gatwick. It described the building of a third runway at Heathrow as the best deal for Scotland, leading to investment and job creation here. It's expected a final decision by the UK Government will be made within the month. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'll be back with the headlines at 8 and the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Until then, from everyone on the team right across the country, enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.